الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم للشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولدي آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرح هو خير مما يجمعون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين الله عز وجل created the human being with desires and Allah talked about that, that in surah ali imran he said, Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawati min al nisa wal banin wal qanatir al muqantarati min al dhahabi wal fidda wal khayl al musawama wal anami wal harf. Allah made for men, for instance, women desirable. He made children, having children desirable. Um, and then having wealth and assets and businesses and investments that grow desirable, a beautiful ride desirable. These are things that Allah put inside the soul of human beings, inside, the, inside our psyche. He programmed us to want these things. Other places in the Quran, he makes a list of things that people want. And today what I want to start with is a fundamental question. Why do we want these things? What is in our minds that once we have these things, what's going to come? At the end of the day, the simple answer to that, which every human being knows, is I'll be happy. If I get the job that I really want, I'll be happy. If I get married to the person I want to get married to, I'll be happy. If I'm able to buy that house, I'll be happy. If I'm able to live in this neighborhood, I'll be happy. If I'm able to move to that country or that city, then I'll be happy. Some young man feels stuck in their home. They don't want to live in their small town. They're like, if I get accepted into that university and move to that town, man, I'm going to be so happy, right? So all of these things, they boil down to one common denominator, which you know our great American history describes as the pursuit of happiness, right? So we're looking for this one thing. And we're, we keep trying to find it in these pursuits that you and I have in our lives. In fact, we go through a lot of sadness and a lot of difficulty and a lot of pain because of this dream of acquiring something one day that will make us happy. So you work maybe even at a job that you don't like because you're saving up because you want to get something eventually that's going to make you happy, right? Some kids, they get allowance, right? And they just really want these, this pair of shoes. They're not going to spend their allowance, even though all the other siblings are getting candy, this or that. They're withholding all these smaller happinesses because they're waiting for this bigger happiness. So they're saving, saving, saving so they can buy those shoes or whatever it is that they wanted, a video game or, you know. So this, this idea that we're willing to sacrifice for the sake of a greater happiness is actually a big part of life. It's the reason why students study hard at a university. Studying is not a joyful experience. There are other students in the same university that are partying, that are hanging out, that are wasting their time. And then you have some students that are working really, really hard because some students look at happiness at a party or hanging out or cutting class or going out and chilling or just sleeping. That's their happiness. 
Another student sees, well, you know, this looks like it's happiness, but I really want to have the happiness of being financially independent, of being successful. I want to feel the joy of hearing my dad say that he's proud of me or my family celebrating my graduation or whatever, right? Being the pride and joy of the family. They've got some other pursuit of happiness in their mind. But at the end of the day, the irresponsible one and the responsible one have something in common. They're both pursuing some kind of happiness. So it is actually, if, for the students of psychology, it is one of the most fundamental questions when you're trying to figure out what's going on inside of the psyche of a person. What makes you happy? What makes you happy? And by the way, what makes you happy is a, a question that should be different from what is, what is good stress relief for you? Because ha happiness is something you're running towards. Stress relief is something you're getting away from. You're escaping something. You're stressed out about work. You're stressed out about some family argument. You're stressed out about this or that. Oh, when I'm stressed out, I just go for a walk. Or when I'm stressed out, I just play video games. Or when I have too much anxiety, I smoke or whatever. People have different ways to cope with the pressure of life, right? But that's not what's making you happy. That's just giving you a break. That's not the question. The question is something else. What actually makes someone happy? And this feeling that we have of happiness, it's a very temporary feeling. You, as much as it's desired and pursued, somebody said, you know, somebody posts a picture of some, going to some beautiful vacation and they could see like a, an amazing city behind them, sunny skies, they could see a beautiful escape, you know, the landscape or waterfall or mountains or whatever, and they look really happy. But go to a vacation enough times, they all, all the places start looking the same. It's not, it's not the same excitement for you anymore. It's not, it doesn't make you happy anymore, right? So you, the, this thing that we're pursuing, it's like a moving target. It's not like once you have it, you can hold on to it. It's the same with, you know, what Allah describes. I've talked about this in other khutbah before. Uh, in other khutbahs in Surah Al-Hadid, how Allah describes that the crop turns yellow, right? So the farmer, all he wanted was the crop to grow. He's, the entire year, he's waiting for the crop to grow. And when it grows, they party, they celebrate, they have harvest festivals. Because finally, the fruit of their labor right? Quite literally for a gardener, the fruit of his labor. But even that fruit gets sour. Even the, 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 the stock turns yellow, right? So the idea there is that we can pursue it. Kids are like, man, I just want to get this new, whatever, new, you know, I just want to get a PS5. You can't get it anywhere. It's harder to get than a visa to Umrah. You know, I just really want to get one. If I just had that, then I would, and then they get it. And then, yeah, I don't really have time to play it. It's kind of, well, it's okay. You know, the, the joy of it, the high of it drops real quick. The excitement of a new car, ask two months later. Just ask two months later. The excitement of a new home, ask about a year later. The, the excitement of new clothes you got for Eid or something, or present you got, ask a week later. The excitement drops. So this thing, the, the first point that I wanted to get across is this thing that is so fundamental to basically all of our pursuits. We have to be clear, I have to be clear about myself that it's not in, found in a thing because the moment I have it, it moves on to something else. And then it becomes some, something else and then it becomes something else. I can't hold on, I can't seem to hold on to this thing called joy. And because this is such a fundamental pursuit and it's common to all of us, every one of us is human, every one of us wants to be happy. I would imagine that Allah will talk about it exhaustively in the Quran, how to become happy. How will you finally, and the Arabic word for happiness is sa'ada. And the Arabic word for overjoyed happiness, extreme happiness is al-farh. So these words, you would think you'll find them all over the Quran because Allah wants us theoretically to be happy, right? Because the, the promise of Jannah, the promise of all the rewards, even if it's not spelled out that way, obviously those things are there. Just even thinking about those things makes us happy. That's what Allah wants. But surprisingly in the Quran, Allah does not talk about happiness much at all. In fact, barely at all. And there's only one place where Allah essentially says, and because of that, they should be happy. They should be filled with joy. It's just one place in the Quran, in the entire Quran, in Surah Yunus. So this, what Allah does for some, some subjects that are so vital and so fundamental, instead of spreading them out, He talks about it once, and this is Allah's way of telling us, what I have said here is enough for you to understand all you need to understand about this topic. 
So for instance, he did that with fasting. Allah didn't talk about fasting in the Quran all over the Quran. He talked about it in one place, one time. And that's it. That's all you need to know. Compare that with something like taqwa. Taqwa he talks about in the Quran over a couple of hundred times. Why? Because you can understand it from this point of view. You also can come at it from this point of view, this point of view, this point of view. There's lots of things you can learn about taqwa. It's a big thing. And you can, you can acquire it in many, many, many different ways. And it can come to you. You can be tested with your taqwa in many different ways. So Allah addressed it in many different ways across the Quran. But when it came to something so, what you would think he would talk about over and over again, happiness, like I said again, just this one place in Surah Yunus is fundamentally where he says, the word Sa'ada is used, but here, essentially, this is the place that Allah says, this is Allah's commentary on happiness itself, right? It's, this is Allah's commentary on it. And he didn't just comment on it. He actually said, this is ayah number 58, by the way, and ayah number 58 is the answer, is the conclusion to ayah number 57, actually. So here he's commenting on happiness, but the building blocks, what makes up happiness, isn't the, the ayah before it. That's actually what it is. So in this series of khutbahs, what I'm going to try to do is understand these two ayat. And maybe if we contemplate these two ayat, and, and though I have given khutbahs about these two ayat before, but not from this point of view, not from this psychological point of view, and not from this historical point of view. So we're going to come at the same ayat, and we're going to come at them from a, from a different perspective. To try to understand something about happiness itself, for myself and for you for all of us, so that we can, you know, when we, we truly understand ourselves, maybe we can acquire this thing, the desire for which Allah himself put inside us. He wants, he, I want to feel happy. This is a, this experience I want to have. And for many listening, because you know now, I don't know if this is the case because of we, us living in the postmodern world and because we have more access to each other because of social media, the internet, because the overflow of information, so we know more about each other, or is it, is, 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 is it, is, have, has it always been the case? But we know now how common depression is. We know how common deeply felt sadness and anxiety are. We know how common, you know, people that we live with, people that we spend our entire lives with, are riddled with thoughts all day that take happiness away from them. They could, you know, you could see them and say, hey, what's wrong? And I don't want to talk about it. I just feel sad. I, and they, they have, you know, have a hard time expressing it. So this is an ailment. This, you know, the absence of happiness is an ailment. And the absence of feeling any joy. Actually, honestly, there are some people, if you ask them, when was the last time you actually felt happy? It's a scary question for a lot of people. Because they can't remember. Like, I was happy for this person. I was happy for that person. When was I truly happy? I can't really remember. It's a, it's a hard question. And that's a scary thought, right? That's a really scary thought. So what can, what can we learn from Allah's insight in the Quran on this subject? The first thing I, that, that this khutbah itself is dedicated to is actually what we can learn about it in the ayah itself where he does talk about happiness. He says, whatever this is, the alchemy of happiness, whatever Allah is giving you, he makes a comment about it. He said, huwa khayrun mimma yajma'un. That's the end of ayah number 58. Huwa khayrun mimma yajma'un. And this is from Jawami'ul Kalim, ironically. It's a very comprehensive statement. It is better than everything that they gather. It's better than everything that they gather. And in this is a profound insight from Allah about how we normally figure out that we're going to get happy. If we gather things, then we're going to be happy. Some wannabe influencer, if he gathers or she gathers more followers online, apparently they'll be happy. If I can gather these new gadgets that came out, the new, the 2.0 came out, the, the 13 came out, the 14 came out, you know, the, the newest release came out. If I just gather that, I'll be happy. If I watch the new season of this show, I can gather more episodes under my experience, then I'll be happy. If I can gather more, basically, more money, then I can be happy. If I can gather yet another degree, I can be happy. If I can gather these credentials under my belt, then I will be happy, right? So we're all, whether there are tangible things like money, cars, toys, games, clothes, shoes, bags, you name it, either it's those things or it's intangible things like degrees, 
recognition, followers, appreciation, compliments. Some people like to gather compliments. That's what they're looking to gather. Just somebody just compliment on how good I look or somebody compliment how, on how smart I am or somebody compliment on how funny that joke was. I just need to gather these compliments, right? They, and so in all of these pursuits, and by the way, when you're gathering something, when you're collecting something, like an animal, when, when birds collect twigs for their nest, when ants collect food for their survival, right? Then it takes work. Gathering doesn't just happen on its own, it's work. And in this, in this small ayah, Allah has provided us a really deep insight. People exhaust themselves gathering things that they think will make them happy. They're gathering stuff and that's an exhausting exercise. Either it's physically exhausting, it's emotionally exhausting, or even mentally, they're just sitting in their head gathering thoughts, gathering stuff that's good, that they think will bring them joy. And all of that Allah puts aside and said, what I'm giving you is better than all of those failed collections that you have. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a stamp collection that makes you happy. Or you shouldn't have, you know, some other, you know, some people have shoe collections. Our contractor here at the campus, non-Muslim guy, he has a sneaker collection. He's got a, he's got a gallery in his house of sneakers, right? <laughs> so it makes him happy. I'm not saying you can't have collections or you can't, you know, you can't have things that you, that, that bring you experiences of joy, but there's one thing above all. And, and I've noticed this over and over again, as I've in interacted with people, tried to understand this subject, people that become obsessed with one kind of collecting or the other, you know what? A lot of times I, I said this earlier on that there's the pursuit of being happy and there's escaping stress or anxiety. A lot of times people are escaping something by collecting something. So they're actually spending more time, for example, oh, I love basketball, man. I love shooting around. I love hooping. And they're playing ball and playing ball and they're exhausted. Their legs are hurting. They're still playing ball because there's something at home that they're running away from to play that much ball, right? And, and it's, it's scary that sometimes even you can hide behind, oh, coming to the masjid makes me happy. Coming to the masjid five, which is a great thing, coming to the masjid five times a day. I had an interesting conversation with an imam recently. who has been imam for many years. And he said, I wanted to understand the people that come to my masjid. I wanted to study them. <laughs> Very interesting person. So he actually had, you know, the, the, the regular musallim, the people who regularly come and pray, coming five times to the masjid is not an easy thing, right? So he wanted to understand what motivates them. So he went to each and every person's house, at least 15 or so people, because not too many people can make it every day, right? So 15 or so people, he spent time with them, went to their home, got to know their story, got to understand. And he, 14 out of 15 were getting away from something. Somebody's family, somebody's family member had died. Somebody had a lot of trouble at home with their kids. Somebody had a, you know, and they just, and they were, and even though may Allah reward them for coming to the masjid, but understanding their pain and understanding that they're getting away from something and trying to find peace in something is important to understand. It's important to know. And so what I'm trying to get across to you is that Allah has given us this diagnosis almost, that we try to find escape away from our sadness by collecting things. But actually that's not happiness itself. That can never be happiness. You have people that are, you know, because we're now in the, in the world of impressions, right? The, the world of image, the world of filtered images, the world of, of you know, uh, selfies and the world of vlogs and the world of presenting yourself as an icon of some sort, right? So you're, you're following people that you think are really funny or really successful or really, ha they look happy. Couples that look happy make videos about themselves. And people make videos about how cute their children are. And, they will, and millions of people follow them, right? They're not making videos about when their child is crying their head off and scratching their face and throwing the plate. No, no, not that video. There's a lot of edit, right? There's the one that where they're really cute. That's the video you're gonna see. And so people wanna give this impression and impression. And what happens sometimes these people that look so happy, that look perfectly normal, that look like, man, I wish I had a life that they had. Next thing you know, they commit suicide. Next thing you know, they get diagnosed with some serious illness. Next thing you find out they're, they're addicted to some kind of drugs. Why? Because the, the yajma'un was simply an escape from something else, right? And look, look at how Allah has so precisely 
just made this comment, huwa khayrun mimma yajma'un. It is better than what they are gathering. So first Allah diagnoses in this ayah, this concluding ayah, which is, I'm strangely, I'm starting today from the concluding ayah. So in this concluding ayah, Allah is first saying, Allah is telling us later that all those other pursuits of happiness were just an exercise in collection. That's all it was. It wasn't, it was something that deceived people. It was just something that they got fooled by thinking that that's going to make them happy. And you and I have to really take deep stock inside of ourselves and think, what is it that I am doing that I think makes me happy, but it doesn't actually do it? I, I can't tell you that for yourself. You have to ask yourself that question. What is it that you are doing jamr of? And perhaps Allah is offering something better. You see, and this is my concluding comment for today's khutbah for you, is that Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, He has given us halal and haram, definitely. He's given us some advice on what to do in our homes. He's given us some guidelines on how to spend our money. He's given us guidelines on how to earn our money, on how to do business. He's given us guidelines on how to interact with each other, how to deal with family. He's given us all kinds of guidelines of do's and don'ts. But those do's and don'ts, you can think of them as the, the items sitting on top of a table, but you have to have the table first, the basis on which all the food sits. The basis of it is a way of thinking. There's a, there's a certain kind of thought process. There's a certain kind of personality, a certain kind of outlook on life that Allah builds in the Quran. And when you build that kind of outlook, then all of the instructions that are on top make sense. Then they actually, you will see, and I'll, I'll try and explain over the course of the next few khutbahs, then those instructions actually bring you happiness. And without that basis, without the right thought process, those instructions, those same instructions from Allah, the same instructions of halal and haram and fard and wajib, all of those instructions, they become something that tightens the chest, that become dis discomfort, that become difficult. Isn't it true that two people can be sitting at the same exact table, they're eating the same exact meal, but one of, and one of them is really happy, one of them is really upset. Because it's the same delicious food and they both love the same food. The, the food isn't any better or worse. The temperature in the room isn't any better or worse. Physically, they're not going through, one's going through pain and one's not. But one has something on their mind, one has something going on in their heart that's taken the joy away from eating. Isn't it? There's a, there's a mindset. They're in a different place mentally even though physically they're in the same place. Biologically, they're experiencing the same thing. Their taste buds are experiencing the same thing. In fact, forget two people, even you yourself, you could be in a certain place mentally and the same activity will bring you happiness. You'll be in a good mood and you're in a different place mentally and that same activity does nothing for you. Like, I'm, I'm not in the mood. I don't feel like it. I don't want to do this, right? So that, 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 that mindset is what Allah is, is you know, helping us configure in ayah number 57 of Surah Yunus. And that's what we're going to spend time understanding. Then, then we get to فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ That's what Allah Azza wa is going to, to unlock for us in this remarkable ayah. So I wanted to take my time covering this with you. I've covered this with you before, but again, from a different point of view this time. And inshallah ta'ala, the next time we'll open up the first of those components. There are four items mentioned in ayah number 57. And the first of them, inshallah, my intention is to cover them in the next khutbah, which is, Ya ayyuhan nas, qad ja'atkum ma'idhatum min rabbikum. Part of that will also be, and I'll set the stage for it now, is that this surah, early on, is actually debating with the mushrikeen. Why, why should they believe Quran is the word of God? Why should they believe that? Why could it not be from a human being? That's the debate that's happening early on in this surah. This, this is a surah is a huge conversation between Allah and humanity, right? So the first part of this conversation is why should you believe this is Allah's word? How, why is it not made up? That's the crux of the argument in the beginning. And I told you, this is not the beginning of Surah Yunus. The ayah I'm talking about is ayah number 57. So lots of conversations have already happened. So what does that conversation have to do with this? We have to figure that out too. To understand, because you cannot understand a conversation Allah is having, something Allah is saying, if you don't know where it fits. What, 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 what is it a part of? So all of those explorations, inshallah, will help us 
really get to the bottom of what Allah has to give us in terms of our personal, truly felt happiness that cannot be taken away. A joy that cannot be taken away. A joy that is no longer a moving target. A joy that is no longer temporary. A joy that's no longer artificial. A joy that's no longer an escape from something else. That's the kind of joy that you and I want in our lives. That's the one that he's going to offer to us in these ayat. I pray that Allah Azza wa fills all of our lives with real and true joy and makes us a source of real joy for others. And I pray that Allah Azza wa brings the light of the Quran into our hearts and into the hearts of our family members and protects all of us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.